Many times Christians have found themselves in dark, dark situations where their heart was broken or they were fearful. It looked like it was over. And just the mention of that name, Jesus. I had asthma when I was a child. I used to have asthma attacks and I literally at times thought that I was dying. I was trying to, and anyone that's had asthma will know you're like trying to breathe in and nothing's coming in. And you breathe out and it's like, and it's like your whole mind, body, everyone's like, it's, it's a fearful thing. My mom or my dad would just come in, in bed and just lay their hands on me and say, in the name of Jesus. If you got your Bible this morning, would you turn to Mark's Gospel, chapter 16. This reading that we're going to share this morning is called the Great Commission. This was the Lord's assignment before he ascended up into heaven. This is what he left with the church, with his people. This is what they're here for. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So this morning, uh, we're part five of It is Time for an Intelligence Briefing. Part five. Um... I want to say this here by way of introduction. The way a lot of Christians talk today, you would think that the devil was sovereign and that he could actually do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. Is that the reality? They basically have a big devil and a small Jesus, but nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, the opposite is actually the truth. So I have a question right at the start of this message. If the devil had such power, do you think that you would be here this morning? If the devil was sovereign, if he could do whatever he wants to do, do you think you would be alive today? Do you think your family would be alive? Do you think that you would be in full health and strength today? Do you think this church would exist today if the devil could do whatever he wants to do? Okay, so let's just kneel that lie right at the start of this message. The devil is not in control. Over this past few weeks, we have been having an intelligence briefing, basically looking at our arch enemy, the devil. And I should say at the outset of this message, the church has impeccable intelligence. Okay, every intelligence system out there is imperfect. They don't know it all. Uh, there's a lot of times they have to fill in the blanks. They speculate. They anticipate. They use circumstantial evidence to, to, to come to conclusions in regard to intelligence. Uh, but our intelligence system couldn't be better. Uh, there's no shortcomings in it. And there's nothing that God doesn't know. So he puts in his intelligence manual, the Word of God, all the detail that we need to identify the enemy, confront the enemy, and then overcome the enemy. We should have a great confidence in God's manual, the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Think about it. He could have put anything he wanted in that book. He could have withheld anything from that book that he wanted. So we know that he has put in this book everything we need to overcome that wicked, vile enemy. Another question why would he leave his children wide open to attack? Why would he leave us ignorant? You know, why, do you think he's sitting in heaven trying to catch us out today? I don't believe he would leave us ignorant because that's not the heart of God when you study the Word of God. 
If you've been here for part 1, 2, 3 and 4, then you should already be aware of who we're dealing with and what we're dealing with. In previous weeks, we have established the importance of knowing who our actual enemy is. Of course, we find out that ignorance isn't an option. If you're ignorant, you're wide open to be attacked. Um, We then identified many of his evil aims against us. The devil has got aims for your life. The devil has got aims for your family. The devil has got aims for this church. The devil has got aims for the United States of America. Now, we can't ultimately control governments, okay? But we can control what goes on inside of here. We can go, we can control what goes on inside of this house. We can stand against wickedness out there, but we can't control people. The heart of man is continually wicked out there today. Um, this morning, I want to look again at how we can effectively counteract the devil and his schemes. How do we do that? Well, let me remind you of what we've been looking at and what we are about to look at um, this morning and maybe in weeks to come. Number one, get close to the Lord. If you want to counteract the devil, get close to the Lord. Number two, be enlightened. Let the light shine. Don't be ignorant. Number three, put on the whole armor of God. Number four, protect your mind. Number five, resist what has been thrown at you. Number six, remove the existing junk. Number seven, employ the word to injure the devil. Number eight, use the name of Jesus and highlight the blood of Jesus Christ. We're going to cover that today. Number nine, let the power of the Holy Spirit enable you to overcome Satan. And we'll be talking about prayer, worship, um, and many things when we're talking about the Holy Ghost. And by the way, you cannot divorce these nine things. One thing I said last week is they, they kind of all overlap each other. They're all like integrated. Okay, so if you say that, well, that overlaps with that. Yes, that's correct. So we've covered one to seven um, in this past few weeks. I want to look at number eight this morning, which is use the name of Jesus and highlight the blood of Jesus. And I'm telling you, if you're a Christian, and you find yourself in a dark place, you want to use these two things to confront and to overcome the enemy. The name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus Christ. They say it's not what you know, but who you know. Who's ever heard that statement? Do you agree with that? In business, is that not right, Curtis? Huh? You know, I, you could have all the qualifications that that you need. But I'm telling you, if you've got friends in high places, they can open doors for you. Okay? Well, guess what? It's not what you know, but who you know. Knowing the right person or mentioning the right name at the right time can carry influence. It can open doors in your life. It can get you the right job you want. It can get you the right opening, the opportunity, even in sport. If people are in the know, they can sometimes get an easy path to a place of prominence. But when it comes to spiritual matters, it's not always what you know intellectually of this book. But it's who you know. I'm telling you, there's men that know this book from cover to cover. They could quote to you, bamboozle you with scripture. But I'm telling you, when it comes to spiritual warfare, they're impotent. Have you found that? I mean, just because somebody's got letters after their name and they've been to this theological seminary, it doesn't mean that they're some great spiritual warrior. Some of the greatest liberal speakers out there are actually professors. Professors in so-called Christian colleges. So they've fallen at the very basic first hurdle that they don't even know how to resist the devil because they've embraced the lie of the devil. They're walking in the lie of the devil. So, you can have a lot of intellectual knowledge about God's truth, but 
The question is, do you know him this morning? Um, being part of an army does not just require information on your enemy. It requires knowing what your armory is, what your weaponry is, and then using it. So, what is in a name? What's in a name? A person's name is a summary of his or her character. Whenever a name is mentioned, a demand is made on the power inherent in that name. It used to be in the old days that names carried even greater weight. The names that people um, give to their children were actually making a statement or, or speaking a blessing over them. Um, today we just say, oh, there's a cool name. There's somebody in Hollywood or there's this pop star has that name. Is that a cool name? Or there's a top football player or soccer player and it's like, yeah, I'd love, I would really love to call my child that. But we don't actually step back and think, what this name that I'm giving my child, I'm actually speaking something over them. Huh? I mean, I always get a chuckle out of um, what Moses called his son whenever he was in the wilderness. Anybody know what his son was called? Gershom? Gershom means I was a stranger in a strange land. Huh? <laughs> so Jesse, imagine meeting him saying, I'm a stranger in a strange land. But he was testifying. It was a test of money of where Moses actually was. But I'm saying names are important when it comes to Scripture. Um, name denotes character, but it also denotes authority. Name denotes authority in natural life. Name also denotes authority in the spiritual realm. If you are a representative, a spokesman, or an ambassador for a company, for a nation, for a sports team, or whatever, name can carry weight. Would you agree if you said the President of the United States has sent me here to talk to you, Mr. Putin? Do you think that, that his words carry weight or not? You think Putin's going to just ignore that or is he going to prick his ears up and go, I wonder what he's going to say? Huh? When, when an ambassador leaves the United States to represent a nation and says, I'm here on behalf of the president to tell you this, I'm telling you there's authority in that. But we come with a greater authority than from the president of the United States. I'm not just talking about me as a preacher this morning. I'm talking about you. Christian, this morning, you are here carrying heavenly authority. By the way, when you became a Christian, you took on the name of Christ. What does the name Christian mean? I'm a follower of Christ. I belong to Him. He's mine and I'm His. If you represent the kingdom of God, then you're here to represent the interests of Christ. What's greater? We have talked about a name carrying authority. So then I have a question. How much authority resides within Jesus Christ? Do you realize that all power, all authority resides within the Lord Jesus Christ? When Jesus came to this earth, he carried heaven's authority. That's incredible. That's why he could talk to water and say to water, change into wine. And it changed instantly into wine. That's why he could walk on water. That's why he could say to a blind man, see, and he saw. Because he was authority. He, what God says, goes. Philippians 2.9 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, Jesus, and given him a name, which is above every name. There's not a name that you can mention that is higher than the name of Jesus Christ. If you realize this when it comes to spiritual warfare, you can say, in the name of Jesus, and you carry authority. I'm talking about a man or a woman of God uh, walking in the Spirit and being sensitive to the Spirit and then relaying what the Spirit says to them 
It's as if Jesus Christ is standing there. If the devil's attacking your family and you say in Jesus' name go, guess what? If the devil's in your head and he's planting all types of junk in your head, you can say in Jesus' name go. And you are carrying heaven's authority. Do you think the devil has a choice? I mean, does he have a choice? When Jesus says something, does he have a choice to negotiate and or say, you know, give me a few days. Just give me a few weeks. Do you think Jesus is going to even play that game? There is 0% chance. But I'm telling you, when you align with him and you boldly stand on God's truth and say, no, I refuse that, the devil is immediately and instantly stripped of his power. So, do you realize that this same mighty Jesus lives within you this morning, Ron? Do you realize this? You're his. That's why it says in 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You need to know who is for you this morning. You need to realize that when Satan attacks you, he's attacking Jesus. When you come into the workplace on a Monday morning, Jesus should be coming into that workplace. When you go into a school on a Monday morning, Jesus should be coming into that place. That's why sometimes there's a reaction to your presence. And I'm saying even to the degree is when you go to the grocery store, when you go to the gas station, sometimes people react to the spirit within you. And they don't even know why they're reacting. This is a big thing to realize that Jesus Christ resides within frail vessels like you and me. By the way, it's not smart to attack a Christian. Because they're attacking Jesus. But please know the authority Jesus exercised, he wants you and me to exercise. And in our main text, I don't know whether you picked up on it this morning, I want to look at it just to see in the name of Jesus what power we have over the demonic realm. So listen to the last words of Christ before he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. It says in verse 15, He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 17, And these things, these signs, shall follow them that believe. In my name, in my name, in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. As Christians, the highest authority on planet Earth has been delegated to us. Jesus Christ has commissioned us to enforce his will on this corrupt planet. He has filled us with his power. He has anointed us with his authority. We possess divine authority this morning. That is why we come in Jesus' name. What was the disciples' response to this? Well, thankfully here, it was a good response. I think we're getting, the longer it went on, they started to get it more and more. So instead of fighting with the Lord, now it's, it says, they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. These guys were starting to get what it was to be a Christian. They had to go through many failures, many weaknesses, <coughs> open their mouth when they should have been keeping it shut and shutting their mouth when they should have been opening it. But the longer it went on, the more they started to realize it's really smart to listen to Jesus. Why? He's always right. Every 
Every one of us in this service this morning can find ourselves in dark situations. We live in a demon-possessed world today. I'm telling you, it's dark out there. You wonder why people dress the way they dress, talk the way they talk, why governments are going down such a, a, a sick and perverted road. Because there's a lot of demons out there that are having a lot of influence. So when you and me, living in this day, go out into that world, there's going to be a reaction. There's going to be a kickback. And of course, we sometimes always interpret that kickback as, they don't like me. Or, they're out to destroy me. Well, sometimes we need to step back and realize that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. There's a spirit behind that. There's a spirit controlling that person. There's a a spirit controlling that institution. There's a spirit controlling that government. And it's not the spirit of God. So when we get a kickback, we need to get into spiritual mode and realize when we go into that workplace, we're coming into it in the name of Jesus. There's times that I'll say this. I was in a situation this week. I didn't really even want to go into it. There was a lot of people there. And I'm like, would you go before me, Lord? I'm going in in your name. And I'm telling you, if you're active for the Lord, I'm saying if you're active, you will be led into some dark situations. Jesus was. You will come against some dark resistance. Jesus was. And the resistance is not a sign that you're out of the will of God. It's normally a sign that you're in the will of God. Amen. You know, people say, why, do I, why is everything a fight? Hello? You're a soldier in an army fighting against a strong, stubborn foe. But he who is for us is stronger than he that is against us. Completely. I don't care how big that demon is. I don't even care how many demons is against you this morning. It doesn't really matter. In the name of Jesus, go. Are you with me? So what I'm saying is we should not just resist the devil, but we need to resist him in Jesus' name. Be no, under no illusion. The devil knows the power of that name. He's been suffering from it for thousands of years. He is fully aware that there's power in the name of Jesus. That name has brought comfort and peace to multiple millions of Christians over the centuries when they were under attack. Many times Christians have found themselves in dark, dark situations where their heart was broken or they were fearful or it looked it looked like it was over. And just the mention of that name, Jesus. I know as a child, I, I had asthma when I was a child. I used to have asthma attacks and I literally at times thought that I was dying. I was trying to, and anyone that's had asthma will know you're like trying to breathe in and nothing's coming in. And you breathe out and it's like, and it's like the, your whole mind, body, everyone's like, it's, it's a fearful thing. My mom or my dad would just come in, in bed and just lay their hands on me and say, in the name of Jesus. And something changed. I'm, it, it done something to me as a child. Just the very mention of the name of Jesus brought calm, brought breath into my body, brought peace in the midst of a storm. In the name of Jesus. And I'll tell you, sometimes it doesn't need to be a complicated prayer. It's simply in the name of Jesus Christ. Even that there phrase. I, I don't know about you, but even to this day, somebody just praying and saying, in the name of Jesus. Or agreeing with you. Just let me pray now, Paul. Let me pray for this right now. And just in the name of Jesus Christ. Devil, you're a defeated foe. You're subject to the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, we have to exercise it, not as mere words, but by faith. The devil knows whether you're exercising faith or whether you're exercising fear. Like you're trembling, oh, in the name of Jesus. And I'm telling you, you need to exercise it by faith on the authority of God's word. I tell you, no devil or go devil. Um, one of the things that you'll find in this book is that 
a lot of these things are very simple, but we complicate them. Would you agree? Like, and the last thing I want to do is, is mention the nine points, make it complicated to you. I believe these nine points are just intertwined. So I'm just trying to practically help you and show you that the simpler we keep it, the better. Um, when you step out under Jesus' direction and and under his control to represent him, you carry much authority. Um, when you're in the Spirit, you can employ this name and carry heaven's authority, just like Jesus did. Remember, the devil is not so much scared of you. He's not so much scared of your reputation or your knowledge. He's scared of the person you're representing. I know that we want to take it upon ourselves that we're God's great man for the hour. That's not what the devil's scared of. Do you understand? That's pride. What the devil is scared of is the fact that within you is a power, is a person, is a name that he cannot handle, he cannot overcome. And any of you that have even dealt with demons, have confronted demons or interacted with them, know that in that name you can tell them to shut up and they must shut up. Even if you're not even casting them out of the person, you can say, is that demons talking to you? You can tell them to shut up. I'm not saying that after a few minutes or a few moments that they don't want to talk again. And you need to remind them. But I'm telling you, you don't have to, you don't have to accept what the devil's speaking out. You just have to show him who's boss. And it's not you talking, it's the Spirit of God speaking through you. And let me say in that, just in regard to deliverance, those who want delivered will be delivered. Okay? Those who don't want to delivered will not be delivered. That is not upon you. If you if you have a heart to see somebody delivered, you know they're demon possessed, but they don't want to deliver, there's no prayer, there's no words, there's nothing you can do that will change them. Now, you have the ability to cast that demon out, but you better be careful. Why? Because if that person doesn't truly want to be born again of the Spirit of God, seven greater demons can come and overrun that human being. So no, and sometimes it's hard because they, they sound right. Yeah, I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven. But how many of them want to be holy? How many of them really want to sh run from sin and embrace righteousness? That's the issue, okay? I want to give you a couple of examples to, to show the power of this man, Jesus. Acts 5.40 when they had called the apostles and beaten them, this is back when the, the religious were resisting the early church, when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Why would the religious be so scared of this name Jesus after he had been crucified? Remember, he had been crucified here. Do you know why? Because they knew he was alive. He was alive in the disciples. He was moving on the right hand and the left hand. And they were scared of this name Jesus. By the way, the devil in them was scared. And again, you have to always, when you're reading about the wicked, whether it's secular or whether it's religious, you always have to look behind the people, what the people's doing, and go... What's the devil scared of here? He's telling them, don't want you to mention this name. They were commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. Is that powerful? Is that not testimony that there's something about this name? Acts 4, 18 is the same. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For ye cannot, we cannot, but speak the things which we have seen and heard. 
what is it about this name that the religious don't even want you to mention that name? Have you found, have you discovered over this last few years that you can get on the television, you can go into the workplace and, t- and mention anything apart from this name? You can talk about any amount of perversion on the television. You can come into the workplace and talk about your immoral rights and and put it even into rules. But if somebody comes in and starts to talk in the at lunchtime about Jesus, you're hey, we need to talk. We need to talk. You do that once more, you lost your job. Why is that? Is it because the boss hates you? No, it's because the devil in your boss doesn't like the name of Jesus and doesn't like it when you start to share the good news with those people in the workplace because they could be delivered by the name of Jesus. Can you see that it hasn't for 2,000 years the devil has been scared of the mention of this name? Why did they not want any mention of the name of Jesus? Because Jesus was still alive He conquered every enemy of righteousness because salvation can only be achieved in Christ alone and what he achieved for us. Uh, Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other name. For there's no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. Why does he not like to mention his name? Because there's power in that name. Devils tremble at his mention. Also, because there was and is controversy in that name. Because that name divides men in two. I'm talking about the real Jesus. I'm not talking about the religious Jesus out there, which the Bible calls another Jesus. Um, Do you remember the day that Jesus went into the synagogue in Capernaum on the Sabbath day? and was immediately confronted by a demon. It says in uh, Mark 1.23, And there was in that synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Isn't that amazing? That's a demon. That's a demon talking. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold your peace and come out of him. Basically, shut up. Seriously. Just shut up. Right, get out. Huh? You know, I'm just telling you, if you are in a similar situation, how often do we do that today? We just say, that guy's running his mouth off. He basically says, shut up and get out. And I'm telling you, whether you're a young person in this church or whether you're mature in your faith, you should not be scared of coming into a situation like that and confronting it and overcoming it because the blueprint's there. We have authority. We don't come in by fear. We come in with boldness. And we just tell the devil what he has to do. Amen? Devils tremble. When Jesus turns up. And if Jesus is in you, you should be turning up with Jesus. Charles Spurgeon says, What a power there must have been in the name of Jesus that even when it was mentioned, away went the devils directly. Not just with the Lord himself, but with the disciples. You see, just the mention of his name, devils run. What about Matthew 8, 28? And when he was come to the other side, into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. People were scared of these guys. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus? Thy Son of God, art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them a herd of swine feeding. 
So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of the swine. And what did he say? Go. Go. Do you know what? You could teach a child who knows Jesus to say that. Go. In the name of Jesus, go. He just had to say go. But I I would recommend to you, because that was Jesus, I think we need to say go. And in the name of Jesus, go. In the name of Jesus. On the authority that is designated and delegated to me, I command you to go. And I think when you see this and when you feel this and you start to function in it, it gives you an actual awareness of who we actually are. So often we get stuck in the natural realm. Amen? I'm telling you, if you spend most of your time in front of the television watching the news, you're not going to feel a boldness. You're going to be discouraged. You're going to get weary, grieved, uh, frustrated, angry, uh, hateful. Just, Lord, nuke them. Just nuke them. Take them out of the game. Huh? I don't know about you. I, listen, I, I can tolerate listening to some of these clowns about five minutes. And then it's like, I start to get agitated. They, they start to grieve my spirit. I, I, I can't tolerate it. It's like you're full of yourself and you're full of the devil. And I'm not going to listen to the devil. And then you wonder why you've lost your peace. You're listening to the devil. It's time for the devil to listen to you. You fill yourself with all that there junk day after day. And I'm telling you, it's no wonder so many Christians are defeated. It's wonder so many Christians, when you talk to them, they want to talk about everything else but God and the things of God. Listen, I don't mind every so often talking about politics or sport or about life. I, it's okay. But I, I, that's not the focus of my attention. I want to talk about God, the things of God. I want to talk about the Word of God. You know, Christians should be different from the world. Now, they may start talking to you in the van when you're going to work. To maybe a workplace, Les, they may be talking about the football. But somewhere in that conversation, there will be an opening, an opportunity where Les can move that conversation and say, hey, I know somebody, um, I know a coach, Brown, from, who's a Nebraska coach. And then, can start, and then I remember him saying this. And before you know it, you've got the conversation changed from there to there. There. What I'm saying is you can box smart. How do I know? Because in the police, they used to put you out with a guy for 12 hours. So, like, okay, I'm designated to go out with this guy. I have 12 hours to put in with this guy, and he's an atheist. So I'm like, oh, boy, Lord, help me. Help me. And not only is he an atheist, but he's a militant atheist, and he's an ignoramus. (laughs) Okay, so I'm like, this is going to be a, a long day. And he's probably in the station thinking the same thing. (laughs) <laughs> he said, oh boy, I'm out 12 hours with Paul and this is going to be fun. But I'm telling you that because I and you had 12, and I know a lot of that time you were busy with calls, running, traffic accidents, sudden deaths. But I'm telling you, there was a lot of times where you, maybe especially on night duty, where there's maybe no calls for three hours. So it's like, what are we going to talk about? So he's either going to get in or I'm going to get in with the subject, but He knows it's going to be a long 12 hours if we don't have a good conversation. (laughs) And I know that. So we can, we start off like superficial, whatever. And before, like we're, we're not even in the car 30 minutes until he's having a go at God and the word of God. So guess what? I'm like, here's my opening. Go and run your mouth off. Go ahead. I'll give you 20 minutes. Just run your mouth off. But then you're going to have to listen to me because you're not going anywhere. I'm driving the car and you're not going anywhere. And even if you want me to stop at that gas station, I choose whether I stop at that gas station. <laughs> okay, But I'm telling you because there's a warfare going on in the car. But I'm not like, oh, isn't this terrible? Isn't this, oh, Lord, why would you put me out with this balloon? Like, It's like, no. I Maybe this guy someday will make it to heaven. Maybe someday there's something small Something simple that you've shared. And what has encouraged me, even since I come to Nebraska, is the contact that I've got from former police officers that have tried to get a hold of me and have suddenly, through Google, been able to get a hold of me or 
they've heard that I'm a pastor and somehow they've got a hold of me and then they've shared a testimony with me. Some of them now are born again. Some of them got saved back in the day. Some of them didn't get saved until 15 years later. And they'll say, I know I used to give you a hard time, but I want to let you know my wife. One guy said, this is what he said. My wife got saved at Easter. Went to an Easter service. And she got wonderfully saved. And she started to torment me. She said she was worse than you were. Because I couldn't get away from her. At least after duty, I could get away from you. Well, she's there day after day after day. Within a year, he got saved. Do you understand what I'm talking about here? There's a warfare, there's a conflict, but why should we be the defeated ones? Why should we say, oh, poor me, why am I having to listen to this? Why am I having to deal with this? Well, maybe you're there to be the voice, the authority that leads to victory in that person's life. The devil might have a hold of him at the moment, but guess what? But God. Devil, your time's up. It's only a matter of time before you're going to have to let loose of that child, that grandchild, that brother of mine or sister I'm talking about in the natural, or that parent of mine or that grandparent. I'm going to keep praying until they get saved. Because you don't call the shots, devil. You're not in control. He is. Martin Luther, the great reformer, he wrote a, a song or a poem like this. Oh, sorry. I'll come. Yeah, it goes like this. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage he can endure, we can endure. For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him or destroy him. One little word. Let me read that again. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. One little word. The name of Jesus. We used to sing when I was young. Or younger, sorry, I'm still young. <laughs> In the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee. Who can tell what God can do? Who can tell of his love for you? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We have the victory. Oh, yeah. There's power in that mighty name of Jesus. Uh, Jesus said in John 14, 13, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Ye shall ask anything in my name, and I will do it. That's called a big speak. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I refuse to give up. I refuse to give up on that person. But isn't that powerful? In the name of Jesus? I think we miss it. Sometimes we're pleading. We're pleading to such a degree that it's really all us. Lord, please don't let this happen. And instead of coming and saying, Lord, on the authority of your word, you say this. And I'm coming in obedience to your commands. And I stand in your place. I, I stand in the place of God. You see, when you come in his name, with his authority, it's just like Jesus is standing in that workplace. And you are his hands, you are his feet, you're his voice, because you're standing in the place of God. After all, he led you to witness to that person. He led you, and you did it. He told you to do it, you did it, so you're talking to this person. It's just like Jesus himself was standing in front of that person. What happens is this. The Lord lays something on our heart. And you know what we do? We shake it off. Well, that's not for me. People did it this morning in prayer. There was people that were meant to pray in this service. And they didn't pray. I know it. I felt it. I felt it. That's why I shared it. But I can't force you to pray. You know, why is there people that never pray in this church? I don't know. But I'm saying that it's not for the preacher to put you on a guilt trip. It's for the Holy Ghost to lay something on your heart. And that's why I said at the start, there's people here who just need to say thank you this morning. I felt the Holy Ghost led that on my heart this morning. 
I'm, I'm just saying, well, that's for my husband to pray. That, that's not for me to pray. Who told you that? What, what voice is actually talking to you? What, what voice is talking? Is that the Holy Ghost? Is the Holy Ghost saying to you, keep your mouth shut? What voice do you think is telling you, you don't need to pray? Well, Pastor Paul told you to pray, so now you don't need to, you, you'll make a fool of yourself. What vo- who, who, who's talking there? I remember talking to a guy, I can use his name because he's used it in the testimony, Michael Hawk. <laughs> Michael Hawk was like Mr. Cynical, Mr. Like, I didn't want to go to church. I mean, Shelby can, and Cameron can, like, he was, he was one of the guys, he was Mr. Like, you know, nobody's going to tell me what to do. And he's a character. I mean, I love Michael. He's just a, a character. You could banter him and he bantered you back. I love that. Okay. Well, m- Megan, Shelby, Cameron brought him to a service. I think it was a gospel service. And it was Sunday night in the fire hall. And I shared the message. And Michael was down to the right there, whatever. And as I'm making the appeal, there, there was no response. And I just said something, which is, the devil might be telling you now that you've got plenty of time and you don't need to respond and you can... Get right with the Lord when you're older. And Michael responded. And he told me afterward that word for word, everything I said, the devil had just told him. Word for word. Word for word, the devil had just told him exactly that. And he said, at that moment, he knew God was real. And he had been a bit, like, been skeptical of was God real or was he not real? But I'm telling you that when God is using you or me to speak His truth and we are confirming what the Holy Ghost is saying in the human being's heart, then we know that God is who He says He is. Do you understand? Because the last thing I would want to do is put you on a guilt trip or beat you up and and make you leave this place defeated. I'm trying to expose the devil this morning. I'm trying to say the devil should not call the shots on what you do, where you go, when you go. The devil should not do that. It's time for the devil to get his eviction notice. It's time for you to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, go. Get out of my head. That's the last time I'll come to a Lord's table and keep my mouth shut because you don't tell me what to do. In fact, you don't tell me whether I go to church or not anymore. It's over. If I want to go to the house of God, which I want to do, I'm going to the house of God. That's spiritual warfare. To open your Bible, the devil says, oh, you don't need to read your Bible today. Well, you know that's not Jesus. It's like, devil, go to hell. Just I'm sick and tired of your lies. And what happens, the more and more you start to overcome the little basic things, like coming to church, reading your Bible, praying, witnessing in the workplace, it starts to become who you are. You are actually defined by him, not by him, that dirty, stinking devil. So, what it is, is if you ask somebody, why, are you, why have you been like that? Why have you been like that for years? And they're like, I don't know. It's just not me. You know, I, I'm just not meant to be there. I'm not meant to be in the prayer meeting. I'm not meant to be in men's theology. I'm not meant to go to church every Sunday. It says who? Who's telling you that? You know, that's what I want to know. Who's talking? Is it the Holy Ghost telling you? But I'm telling you, that's spiritual warfare. But if you can't overcome these little bitty hurdles, how are you supposed to be seeing America one for Jesus? I mean, we're, we're in a warfare here, but I'm telling you what, in that warfare, we have the victory. And the greatest victory you can have is not over the devil, it's over yourself. You're waking up on a Sunday morning, you're tired. Well, sometimes you need to talk to yourself. Huh? Like, get out of bed. You will be in the house of the Lord this morning, self. Huh? Amen? Amen. And by the way, I'm not going to get my message. I'm not even going to get onto the blood of Jesus this morning because maybe we've pitched our tent here and maybe we've had to pitch our tent here this morning. I believe this is a big one. The authority that we possess, that we fight the enemy with, um, when the devil's pointing the finger at you, you point the finger at him. The devil points the finger at you and tells you you're a loser. The devil condemns you and points the finger at you and condemns you. You point the finger back and say, no, I'm not condemned. You're condemned. 
Amen? Amen. What's his condemnation? What's the condemnation of the devil this morning? What's his no, but what's his condemnation? His ultimate doom? Huh? Eternal damnation. What's your eternal future? Eternal life. So you, when he comes to you and says, you're not a Christian, you're not this, you're not that, you're, you, you're not worthy, you, you shouldn't open your mouth to pray. If you were a Christian, blah, 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 you can say, no, devil. You're condemned. I'm not condemned. I'm justified. I'm justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Christian this morning, be encouraged. The fact that you're called a Christian is probably the greatest honor in life. Never, ever, ever apologize. When people are trashing God's truth and trashing the Lord, you should never be ashamed to say, I'm a Christian. What you're saying is, I, I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. So often throughout America, the Christians, whether it's in government, whether it's in the school place or the courts, people are scared to mention this name anymore. That no, and then we wonder why America is on the back foot. You just want him to fill you this morning. It's not that you need to get saved again. It's just you need a reminder of who you are. You get a reminder of who your standing is. You are his. You're his child. He loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. And he said, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I mean, do you believe him? So, did he deny, did he deny you when, when he went to the cross? Was he denying you? Was he ashamed of you? So why should we ever, the rest of our lives, until they put us six foot under, why should we ever deny him again? You know, just let, ask the Lord to give you a fresh touch this morning. As, as you get full of the Holy Spirit, you get full of boldness. But I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus, whatever is coming against you this morning has to go. But you have to exercise that. For your family, for yourself, you know, it could be something simple, like turning up at a prayer meeting. The devil's told you you don't need to go, or blah, blah, blah. You need to identify it, confront it, and overcome it. If you can't identify where that voice is coming from, you could end up walking in that for the rest of your life. But when you can identify the voice that has been spoke over you, you can then confront it in the name of Jesus. And just say no. No. No more. No more. Or go. Open your front door and just say, get out of my home in the name of Jesus. Father, we just thank you for your truth this morning. We thank you for the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, there's no other name under heaven that's given amongst men. Lord, that is greater, stronger, that carries more authority. So Lord, we know this morning we are on solid ground. And Lord, help us to use that name more. Even when we pray to p for people. Lord, even when we cast out devils. Lord, we, we live in a day where you would think, Lord, there's no devils out there, but there's never been more. And Lord, there have never been more active and bolder. Lord, help us to confront those demons. I pray in your mighty name, O oh God, that you would just help us to be the Christians you want us to be. And we pray this in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.